Hi, my name is Lucy and today I am going to tell you about four graphic novel or comic series that are for teens and are both representative of and inclusive of folks in the LGBTQIA plus community. And when I talk about these books today, I'm really just talking about the first book in the series. I don't want to reveal too much more about what happens as you continue on in the series. So generally, it's just the first book. The first series that I would like to tell you about is called Fence. And this is by C.S. Packett, Joanna the Mad, and Joanna La Fuente. And this book was nominated for a GLAAD award. It is a series in four parts and it is about an all-boys fencing school. We have the main character, Nicholas Cox, and at the beginning of the book, he has a fencing match against Seiji Katayama, who is known to be very good. What we learn about Nicholas Cox in the beginning that nobody else knows is that he's the son of a retired fencing champion, but he is the illegitimate son. So nobody knows that he is this man's child and that that might give him a few advantages in fencing. Unfortunately, he loses this first match pretty quickly, and then he gets accepted to a very prestigious boarding school called King's Row. There he encounters Seiji again, and he encounters the legitimate son of his champion father. And right away in th this school, we see a cast of diverse characters. While it is an all boys school, there are many gender expressions and people of different races and sexualities. And that is just part of the story throughout. It's not something that is explained or talked about. It's just who the characters are. So though it might seem to some that Nicholas is not great at this sport, we do learn that he has this sort of secret weapon, which is speed. It makes him able to be competitive at this school. He is unfortunately paired as roommates with Seiji. So these two rivals are so divided that they even put a curtain down the middle of their room. And eventually they do warm to each other. So there is that enemies to friends and possibly more later aspect to this book. Nicholas's best friend at King's Row is named Bobby Rodriguez, who has a huge crush on Seiji. Bobby dresses in feminine clothing, though he uses male pronouns. The author of the book, C.S. Packett, is genderqueer and uses she, her pronouns. And in an interview, she said, in Fence, I wanted to write a male sports team in a way that was less excluding open it up so that it was in some places exuberantly queer, for example, or was welcoming to different types of male expressions. So that's why she placed Fence in an all-male environment where she was allowed to create a lot of different people on one team. And in Fence, any of the characters being attracted to one another is not forbidden. There is a popular upperclassman in this book named Aiden, and he dates a different guy every week. We see this throughout the whole story. He has a adoring cluster of fanboys that are always following them around. One of the cute things that the artist does is instead of putting hearts in the character's eyes for expressing love, they come out of their mouth and that's a really nice touch. So Fence is very interesting visually because of the fencing scenes. It has this really nice diverse cast of characters. You sort of know something about the main character that none of the other characters around him know. So it has that intrigue as well. And after reading the first volume, I definitely wanted to read the other ones. The next comic series is vastly different and it is called Goldie Vance. And this is set in a Florida resort town during the 1960s, very heavily fictionalized. So it sort of looks futuristic almost, but it is the 1960s. And it is about a 16 year old detective in training named Marigold Vance. She goes by Goldie. And her dream is to become a full-time in-house detective at her father's Florida resort. She lives with her parents at the resort. She parks cars, she's a valet parker, but she also fancies herself already to be quite a sleuth. She helps out Walter, who is the hotel detective. And the story is a little bit reminiscent of Nancy Drew in that you have 
Goldie always tracking down these clues. It sort of also has a Scooby-Doo vibe to it. Goldie meets this girl named Diane, who is really cool in sort of a James Dean kind of way, and Goldie immediately falls for her. Diane is an expert at drag racing, and Goldie is also very good at it. That's an interesting part of this book. There are these drag races and a lot of driving scenes, and there's sort of this subversion of gender in that it's women participating in these races, whereas in the 1960s, it would have been men who were driving the cars. Goldie is a really charming main character. She's persistent, she's smart. As I said before, because it has that kind of Scooby-Doo-ish feel, you definitely want to know what the mystery is and you finish this book and realize that that is going to be something that just continues throughout the series. The fact that Goldie is gay is part of the book, but nothing is made out of it in the same way that Fence was just filled with LGBTQ characters, but it wasn't an important facet of the plot of the story. Goldie Vance is by Hope Larson and Brittany Williams. The next series I want to tell you about is called The Backstagers, and this is by James Tinian IV. There's a real magical element to this story. The story starts out with Jory, who is at a new school, and we see him on the phone with his mom. He's crying. He doesn't want to be there. He's worried he won't fit in because he's gay. He doesn't know where to sort of slot himself and what club, and he decides to go to theater tryouts and ends up in the world of the backstage. And this backstage world is unlike any other. Rooms appear and disappear. There are tunnels, there are strange creatures, but the crew, the production crew of this play is really close and they are also a really interesting mix of people. Anyone who's ever worked on the crew of a stage production might really feel at home in this book and understand some of the sort of inside jokes for the backstagers. So Jory is immediately welcomed into this group. There is one member of the group named Hunter who is protective of Jory right away and then becomes very attracted to him. And they, by the end of this volume, you see them as a couple and that does persist into the next volume. We also have a character in this book named Beckett who is a trans man and the story in the first volume is just Jory getting to know these characters and then them having to find something for the actors. The actors are portrayed in this book as a totally uh, different set of characters and very separate from the backstagers, which also rings true for a high school theater production, that separation between crew and actors. And the author, James Tiny in the Fourth, said in an interview, I was an awkward young man who was starting to understand that I wasn't straight. I didn't see myself out there and the few bits of gay representation that I saw were in a stereotypical mold. In building the story, I wanted to go beyond just creating a cast of misfits. I always wanted the book to be about misfits. Misfits are great, but I wanted to have different forms of queer masculinity. And the stage crew for this author was where he found his voice and where he found himself. And that is really also shown here in the way that Jory is accepted into this group. Like the other two books before it, the character's gender expression and sexuality is known, but there's nothing made of it. It's not a point of contention or strife. It just is a part of who the characters are. The last series that I want to tell you about is called The Avant-Garde by Carly Usden and Noah Hayes. And this is a coming of age basketball friendship comic. It's about a character named Charlie. She has just transferred to the Georgia O'Keeffe College of Arts and Subtle Dramatics. She transferred because she played basketball at her first school and had so much anxiety around the games and her performance at them that she lost her scholarship because she wasn't able to play in the games the way that she should have. And she decided to go a different route, to move schools and to pursue another interest of hers, which is making films. So right when she arrives at this new school, which is an art school, she is recruited by this enthusiastic character named Liv, 
who is trying to start a women's basketball team. One does not exist at this school. And so the story begins and Liv has recruited some other people. And this is the cast of characters that we get in the avant-garde. We get personal stories from a lot of them. There's depth of character in this book. It's less of a sports comic, although it is about basketball and it's more about the friendships that are developing and the coming of age. Basketball is the vehicle that lets these characters develop their friendships and learn to trust each other as they really have to when they're playing basketball together. Some of them have to make themselves very vulnerable in order to come together as a group and they realize that it's okay for this to happen and that the outcome is definitely worth it. Liv has such a crush on Charlie and eventually they become involved and it's a really sweet storyline in this first volume. I look forward to reading more about it as the volumes continue. The first team that the women play in this basketball league is, and it's a new league for all schools, so they're not only starting a team at the Georgia O'Keeffe College, but starting a whole league for women's basketball. And they play this team that is so supportive of them. It's just a great game to watch. The other team is losing. The avant-garde play really well together, but the other team is just cheering them on. The other team's main focus is really puppies. They are there to represent a humane society and they would like all these puppies that they bring out at halftime to be adopted. So it is a fun game to watch besides the basketball parts. Like the other three comic series that I've talked about, there are queer characters in the avant-garde, but there isn't any time spent on who uses what label or why. There is a non-binary character who is also selectively mute. We just know that they are non-binary because of the pronouns that other people use to address them. In each of these series, there is this group of characters who are very diverse as far as gender expression and sexuality and race and ability, but none of that is the focus of the stories. And so that allows the characters to be authentically themselves. And because they are in comic book style or graphic novels, you really get drawn into the story and the characters arcs as well, because you're seeing the illustrations in front of you. I would recommend starting with the first volume of any of these series if you have not, and hopefully it will make you want to read more. I know when I got to the end of each one of volume one, I sort of turned the page and was disappointed that there wasn't more of the story right there right away. So I hope you give one of them a try. Thanks for joining me.